communicate or they can communicate in the third set before they play the tiebreaker or just go ahead and then school us on ruling regarding parents and coaches how far they have to stay away from the court. Yeah, well, generally, parents, we ask them to stay out of the player's area, the general player's area, which is where the players sit. We want them to be at least six feet away from that. And they can communicate with players if it's non-tennis related. In other words, do you need another water, things like that? That's fine. They can, of course, cheer and root for their child and say, come on, let's go as often as they want to, as long as it's not interrupting a serve or something that's actually part of the game. Um, you definitely want to follow the etiquette of tennis with that. You don't want to cheer for a player's error, the opponent's error. You don't want to talk at all to the opponent. That's definitely not allowed <laughs> um, because that could be, you know, interpreted as intimidation. So we don't want parents speaking to opposing players while they're playing or anything like that. Um, they are definitely allowed to coach if they split sets during that uh, three-minute break. It could be a 10-minute break if there's been a heat rule or if it's going to be a full third set. There's a there could be a 10-minute break, and they're allowed to coach uh, during that entire time. Okay. Uh, now we have uh, these new devices, cell phone, text messaging. Are the play allowed to have their phone on the court? Well, it can be in the bag as long as it's turned off or on vibrate. They can't use it uh, for communication. Um, obviously, unless it's been a split-set situation, then they can use their phone just as a, if the coach is not there, for example. But uh, the smart watches, all those electronics, they're supposed to be put away during the match, and uh, you know they can access them after the match, but uh, not really supposed to access them during the match. So what happens if you're in the middle of the match and the phone rings from one of the players' bag? What is the yeah, first time I would caution that player to turn the phone off, and then the next time it happened, I'd have to give a point penalty because I already gave him a caution about the phone. Um, what is the rules about ball abuse and racket abuse on the court? Well, obviously, we don't want to have any of the abuse of anything, especially in anger. Um, so for racket abuse, if they throw the racket in anger, and they have to actually throw it, then that would be a point penalty, obviously. Um, if they just bounce the racket or kind of throw it to their bench, you know, after a, a game or something, then I'll probably use that as an opportunity to caution them about uh, racket abuse. Ball abuse, the general rule is if they hit it out of the court and it's going to be, you know, obviously affecting another court or it's going to be affecting spectators, then that's an automatic uh, ball abuse penalty. The ball abuse penalty is only one game. Ball abuse is a, you know, any penalty the first time is only a point. Then the second penalty would be a game, and then the third penalty is a default. That's for all penalties. So sometimes you witness a kid who is so angry that he smacks his racket on the ground and the racket crack. What's uh, right. ruling on that? Well, he'll get, obviously, a point penalty for breaking the racket, as you've seen Serena Williams do plenty of times. Um, and, of course, she's a pro, so they, but they still issue the point penalty. Um, and then that player has to, of course, have another racket to play with. Um, it's, you know, they're going to be subject to other penalties if they have to go get a racket and they have to go off court to get that racket. Okay. So they need to have other rackets in the bag. Okay. So you know where I'm going with this. Uh, this year at the U.S. Open, Djokovic, who is current number one player in the world, hit mm -hmm. a referee with the ball, and the referee uh, collapsed. So he got automatically defaulted. Can you elaborate on this situation? Because a lot of people still talk about it. Yeah, the rule is very clear, though. If you hit a ball in anger and it hits, if it's the opposing player, if it hits the line judge, no matter who it hits, even if you didn't intend to hit them, if it does, in fact, hit them, you're automatically defaulted. So 
that's players all know that rule and that's why it's dangerous for you to hit any ball in anger because if it does hit somebody then you're automatically defaulted i had to eject a um, default player once for he did the same thing he hit the ball in anger and he wasn't trying to hit his opponent but it it did hit his opponent so i had to default that player Okay, so when you default a player like that, uh, do you have additional sanction? That player lose that match and is it suspended or? He no, it's can, just for uh, that. Apply. It's only it's usually only for that match. It's not something that would uh, linger or or you know unless it was. Uh, I mean, you have to spend. I'm um, a junior tennis. You, know, you have to assess penalty points um, that get turned in, and those accumulate over a period of time, and then that that could result. Yeah, if they accumulate, I believe it's 12 points um, within a six-month period, then they're suspended for uh, a period of time. I don't know if it's three months. I think it's usually six weeks, but um, I would have to clarify that because, you know, that kind of fluctuates each year how long the suspension is. But uh, it's 12 points, that's for sure. And that's, you know, like, like a point penalty is typically two points. So if you get a, six of those, then you're going to be looking at a suspension. And you'll get a, you see the player would get a letter from the USTA letting them know, you know, and something they can look, um, they can look it up as well on through the USTA website to see if they have any points uh, accumulated, you know, throughout the year. Let's go into an area where uh, the player is suspended and then uh, when during that suspension period, they don't get any point, any ranking, right? If they were number one in Florida or two, uh, some people can get ahead of them because they're penalized, right? Uh, I guess, yeah, the way you describe it, that that is possible. But, um, you know, we're just trying to ensure fair play. So usually you never want, you know, players notified in the tournament is notified if, if that situation is going to arise. Uh, when can a player get suspended through an infraction committed by either coach, his coach, or his father or, dad or mother? For one incident? Right. Yeah, just clarifying if it's it one incident or accumulation of instances. It will be accumulation, probably. Yeah, if it's an accumulation, you know, like I said, usually it's, it's uh, six weeks, but... You know, it, it, dep- it really depends on what the USTA has. A, there's a group of people that make those decisions, and they can make it from six weeks to anywhere to three months. So it all depends. They can look at other factors of has this student been, uh, has a child had previous suspensions and things like that. So if you're listening to us today, uh, this is Seku Radio. Southwest Florida, Sarasota, Bradenton area. And today our guest is Matt Pfeiffer, who's been a tennis referee for USDA tournament for over 18 years. Matt, is the difference between college tennis and junior tennis? Oh, there are several differences. Uh, There's not a lot of differences as far as what what the rules are. I mean, you still have to follow the rules. The, the only difference is uh, there's just some some little differences. Like in Division One tennis, men's tennis, there are no lets when they serve. So if you, the ball hits the net and it goes in bounds, you must play that return. Um, there are, there are no lets on the serve. And then uh, no ad rule. There's no ads in any of the college tennis anymore. Division One, Division Two, or Division Three, they're all played uh, with no ad scoring. Okay. Other than that, they still have to follow the same rules as, as uh, any junior player would have to follow. Now, of course, there is coaching allowed during college matches. Right. Um, we're getting uh, close to the end of uh, our part one regarding Matt Pfeiffer, a tennis referee, tennis tournament referee. And uh, if you just joined us, this is Siku Radio, Southwest Florida, great guests talking about tennis and rules and regulations, what to do, what not to do. 
uh, is a great deal of information because Matt, with his 18 years experience, is schooling us about what the player should do or should not do. All right, so Matt, we're going to take a brief. Uh, we're going to we're going to end uh, the first part, and then um, the the radio will reintroduce us. Uh, we're going to move into the second part. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. 